Thanks, Doug. Yeah. Uh, so today uh, I'm going to talk to you about Ernest, uh, which is this research project on how to do efficient performance prediction uh, for advanced analytics jobs uh, running on systems like Spark. This is joint work with a number of people, including Zhang Heng Yang, uh, who was an undergraduate at Berkeley when we did this work, and uh, Mike Franklin, Ben Recht, and Jan Stoika were all professors at Berkeley. So the motivation for this work basically came from uh, analyzing a number of workload trends and talking to a number of users at places like the Spark Summit on what kind of workloads are they running in the cloud. So uh, one of the recent trends that I guess many of you would be aware of is this uh, widespread adoption of large-scale machine learning workloads to do, let's say, for example, image classification, where we build models like uh, detect cats in pictures. Uh, but also these machine learning models are used for other things like speech recognition on your phone. And it's not just in the consumer space. If you look at a lot of the scientific applications today, like for example, to do like solar flare detection or to detect if gravity waves are present, even these things use like a number of like these data processing frameworks uh, because they're, ex they're trying to look for like these scientific answers in large amounts of data. So many of you might be wondering, uh, so how do these jobs look and how are they similar or different when you compare them to like, let's say, some of the traditional SQL queries uh, that we run using Spark. So to give you an example, I'm going to walk you through uh, one such uh, advanced analytic workload, uh, which is the speech recognition pipeline that we run, ran on this TIMID data set. So I've called it as the TIMID pipeline, uh, using one of the projects that I worked on at Berkeley uh, that is Keystone ML, which is a framework for doing some machine learning. So at a high level, the pipeline looks something like this. We start off with some raw data. Uh, and then we extract some speech features from this raw data. So we start with these wave files and we extract some like features from it. Uh, once we extract the features, we then do a bunch of like featureization steps. So for example, we do a cosine transformation in this workload. Um, following that, we might do some normalization on the output of cosine transformation. And after that, we might pass it on to a, a, a learning algorithm, for example, a linear solver or like an SVM like solver, uh, which will ultimately learn the model. So now this is a logical view of how this workload would look. When you actually try to run this on a system like Spark, uh, it ends up looking something like this, where each machine has some subset of the data and is doing some subset of the, this pipeline. But also this pipeline could have some complex communication patterns within itself. Uh, and finally, most of these jobs are iterative. So for example, this pipeline might be run like hundreds of iterations for us to get to a more accurate model. So some of the properties of such workloads include the fact that these workloads are, uh, when, when you compare them to like some traditional analytics workload, they're like much more numerically intensive. So they use a lot of like CPU intensive operations, for example, like BLAST libraries or like GPUs and so on in order to do their processing. Uh, the other important characteristic is that they, they are iterative. So uh, they run usually a really large number of iterations before you can converge to a good model. And finally, because of the fact that they're iterative and we are running these really large number of iterations, they're also usually long running and hence uh, expensive. So for example, if you rent out some uh, VMs on like Amazon EC2, you might have these VMs up for like a couple of days or like a week in order to like train this like model end to end. So this is on the workload side in what uh, users are running. How does it look on the system side? So one of the main challenges that users face when they go to deploy such workloads is that you're often forced to confront the innumerable number of choices that cloud computing gives you. What do I mean by choices? So for example, Amazon EC2 itself has more than like 42 different like instance types, each of them having slightly different amounts of memory and CPU and network bandwidth and so on. And it's not just Amazon, even other providers like Azure and like Google Cloud Engine also have like similar uh, different number of varieties of machines that you can rent from them. But let's say even we choose an instance type, we are still not done because we also need to choose the number of such instances that we want to run. And the calculation of this is often really challenging and it leads to sort of this tyranny of choice where users have like these huge number of choices on what they can use and it's often very difficult for them to figure out what makes sense for the particular workload that they want to run. So on the other hand, the concerns that the user have or the answers that they would like or the question that they would like answers to is something along these lines. So for example, they have a deadline in their mind. So they have like something like, oh, I want to run this within like next two hours. And they want to know how, what is the cheapest way in which I can run this. Or on the flip side, they have a fixed budget where they might say, I have a budget of like $100. And uh, how do I, how, what is the fastest way I can run this job if I'm going to use $100? 
And there's very little support in existing infrastructure today in order to enable uh, such answers to such questions. So in this research project, we did a couple of things. So the first thing we tried to do was try and study if these choices actually matter, like how much do they matter for different kinds of workloads, and can we come up with some ways to answer this question uh, in an effective manner. So to understand if choices matter, we basically ran a bunch of workloads by varying the instance type and the number of instances and tried to measure how the end-to-end -end running time changes. So here's a simple example. It's a matrix multiplication workload, uh, which is commonly used in a number of like, numerical applications. And uh, we did this with uh, a, a number of different setups where we tried to normalize the total number of cores and the total cost. So in this setup, what we have is we have one R3.8 extra large or two R3.4 extra large machines up to like 16 R3. large machines. They all have 16 cores. They all have 244 gigs of memory, and they all cost $2.66 an hour. But the performance you'll get from each of them could vary a lot. So in this case, for example, the one big machine actually runs really fast. It finishes in like five seconds, the whole job. Uh, but the four R3 or two extra large machines take like 25 seconds to run it. But it's not actually, there's no like linear pattern as well because the 16 R3 dot larges are in fact better than the four uh, R3 dot two extra larges. So this was for one of the workloads, matrix multiplication. We, for example, this could vary also as you change the workload. So we ran this uh, other algorithm called QR factorization using the same setup that we had before. And in this case, the pattern looks a little bit different. So in this case, the one big machine is actually much slower, and using like 16 small ones is actually much faster. Now, this might seem pretty non-intuitive to you, like why would one machine be slower in some case and faster in some case and so on? And we investigated this a little bit more, and the main reason is that the bottleneck on the, what resource this, uh, the workload is using a lot, it changes based on what workload you use. So matrix multiplication, for example, is like network bound. So if you use like one large machine, we don't have any network access, and so it actually runs really fast. On the other hand, QR factorization was really memory bandwidth bound. And when we use like 16 small machines, we're actually getting a lot more memory bandwidth than what we can get from like one large server. So such kind of, uh, such kind of what the bottleneck resources for each workload is actually very hard to judge for a user when they have like a complex job that they're trying to run. So that is in terms of instance types. Uh, what about the number of instances that we use to run? So using the same QR factorization workload, we fix the instance type here, and we just change the number of such instances we launch. And you might expect that if you double, let's say, the number of uh, instances you have, you would, let's say, get half the running time that you started off with. Like That would be like linear scaling. right? And that will be some ideal behavior that users might expect. But what we actually see in practice is that the, the scaling is actually quite sublinear. So in this case, for example, up to uh, around 64 cores or so, uh, the workload scales pretty well. But after that, you sort of hit this like uh, a plateau where you can double the number of cores, but the performance really doesn't change at all. The main reason for this being that each of these algorithms has some amount of computation and some amount of communication. And if you increase the number of cores, you're increasing the communication, and that leads to this kind of like nonlinear scaling. So hopefully by now I've motivated to you the fact that uh, these choices do matter a lot and that it's actually extremely hard for users to come up with what is the ideal choice for their algorithm uh, without knowing and doing a lot of this profiling work manually. So in this project we wanted to automate some of this or try and study what would be ways to address this problem. And uh, our high level goal in this work was to try and come up with a performance model that could answer these kind of what if questions. So in some sense, we wanted to come with a model where you could ask it, what would happen if I double the number of machines? Will my running time go down in half, or will it actually stay the same? And the big challenge in doing this is that we're dealing with these kind of like black box jobs where we don't know much about what is running in the job. Um, and we also want to have pretty low overhead in terms of building this model. Like we don't want to spend a lot of time building this model. And uh, the main insight as to why we think this would actually work is that we think we can actually exploit some of the structure that's present in these workloads and thus build a more cheap model that can actually answer these kind of what if questions. So with that, I'll switch to the second half of the talk where I'll talk about our performance model or like how we go about building them. So at a very high level, to build a performance model, we break down the total time taken into two halves, computation and communication. 
Uh, and we try to study the scaling patterns of each of these things separately. So in terms of computation, um, for data parallel uh, frameworks like Spark, the computation pattern sort of scales as you increase the number of tasks that are running on the system. So for example, if I double the number of tasks that I have with the same number of cores, uh, if each task takes the same amount of time, my time taken proportionally grows linearly as the size of the input grows. On the other hand, if we increase the number of cores that are available, similarly, the time will inversely come down with respect to the number of cores that we have. So in the same example, if I go from two cores to four cores in the system, uh, you would expect my total running time to come down uh, uh, by half uh, because the time scales inversely in this case with the number of machines. This is assuming a linear relationship between the input size and, and, the, and the overall running time. We, we could similarly model n log n or n squared relationships as well. So computation was pretty simple uh, to analyze. Uh, communication, though, is a little bit more trickier because there are a large number of these communication patterns, and it's often challenging to think of uh, how are all these patterns working together. But looking more closely, what we found was that uh, because systems like Spark only use two or three communication patterns regularly, uh, we can actually just model each of them and thus get an overall effect of what is going on. So what do I mean by a few handful of patterns? So one common pattern we found was, for example, this one-to-one -one pattern, where the output of one task is the input to the next task. And so if you increase the number of tasks, the total time sort of remains the same, uh, because if the uh, amount of data between the tasks interchange is staying the same. Uh, but there are other patterns, like, for example, this tree aggregation pattern. Uh, this is found, for example, in uh, operations in Spark, like tree reduce or something like that. Uh, where as you increase the number of tasks, you get a log factor uh, increase in the total running time because this, the number of like, uh, stages in the tree increases as log n. Uh, and finally, we have the linear pattern, which uh, you might uh, see in uh, operations like reduce or broadcast in Spark, uh, where as you increase the number of like, tasks that are running, you get a linear increase in the total running time. So putting this all together, we can form what is a simple high-level performance model for such jobs. Uh, as a sum of a number of terms. So uh, the total running time, for example, in this case, is the time spent in serial execution, which is x1, uh, and x2 times the time spent in computation, which is uh, the term that I talked about before, and then some terms for the time spent in communication, which includes the log factor and the linear factor. So this is a very simple linear model that at a very high level is capturing the overall execution time in terms of a number of terms. Now, once we have such a model formulation, what we can do is we can collect some training data for this sort of model fitting, and then we can use some off-the-shelf libraries in order to fit the model that we're going to use for our system. Now, one thing you might ask is, is this model good enough? Like, this seems like a pretty simple model, and all my Spark jobs are like so complex, and they do a lot of things. Uh, does it actually cover all these Spark jobs? So to figure out if our model was good enough, what we did is we took all of the algorithms implemented in MLlib, uh, which is in Spark, and then we try to mar match what are the terms that we use in our model and how well do they map to what actually uh, is used by the algorithm. So what we found was that we were actually be, uh, able to cover most of the algorithms pretty well using just a handful of terms. Uh, and this is very encouraging because if you have a very simple model, it means you need less training data to, tr to train that model. Uh, which takes me to the second part of the talk, which is about collecting training data. So, why is collecting training data an important problem? So I, initially, I talked about the overhead of building a performance model. And all of the overhead in building this performance model comes from how much time we are spending in collecting the training data. So if you want to collect training data from, let's say, 16 different configurations, then we're going to be running the job 16 times in order to build a performance model. Now, that is obviously pretty expensive. So in this work, we also tried to come up with some clever ways to minimize the amount of time that we spent in collecting training data. Uh, and to take a step back, what are some of the parameters that's controlling how much data we need? So if you look back to our model, there are two variables that we have, which is input size and number of machines. These are the two variables in our model. So a, a, a naive approach would be to form a grid of these two variable values and collect values at all the points in the grid. So a slightly better approach, this was the first thing that we tried, was to uh, uh, do some, some kind of a greedy approach where we only pick the cheapest uh, uh, configurations, and we collect training data from that. So we and to do this, we associate some cost with, let's say, each of these configurations. But we found that this was actually not that good, and the models we trained with this were like very inaccurate. 
and that we, could, we needed to do something actually a little bit better. Uh, and to do something better, we, we actually went back to statistics and we actually tried to uh, use the structure that is there in the linear model that we have and recursively apply some machine learning on it uh, in order to come up with the optimal set of training data points. Uh, I'm going to walk you through, a, uh, give you a very high level overview of the math that is going behind this thing, uh, and I can, I'll be happy to talk more about this offline as well. Uh, so the main technique that we used in order to minimize the amount of training data collected uh, comes from this a branch of statistics called the optimal experiment design. Uh, and the idea here being that you can actually put down all of the uh, options that you have for where you want to collect training data into this sort of giant matrix, and then you can try and minimize some property of that matrix, uh, which will help and tell you what are the best data points that you need. So in this case, what we were doing is we were minimizing the trace of this like covariance matrix, uh, and we, we subject this to a constraint saying that the total set of points that we pick should still be within some budget that we have. Now, all of this sounds a little bit complex, and you might be worried, oh, this looks pretty complex. How are, how are we going to do this, and how are we going to run this? Is this going to be expensive, and so on? Uh, but the nice thing about this is that this is actually a small data problem. Like, the number of configurations that we're usually dealing with is on the order of, like, hundreds or so. And we're trying to pick, like, five or ten of the best of them out of, like, hundred. And, in fact, it turns out there are off-the-shelf solvers, like CVX, where you can just encode the problem that I had on the previous slide into them as, like, a formula. Uh, and you feed it in your 100 configurations, and it'll tell you what the best configurations to use are in terms of the number of machines and input size. So, so that works uh, pretty well. And to put it all together, uh, I've talked about a number of things in, in, in the last 15 minutes or so, is the workflow of how you would go about using the system that we built called Earnest looks something like this. From the user side, we get the job binary that they're trying to run and some sort of grid of values that we should try for uh, building uh, our model itself. And then all, both of these are fed into this box. And inside this box, we run a number of modules which are going to uh, actually perform some of the actions that I described earlier in the talk. So the first action is going to be, it's going to run experiment design, try and figure out the optimal set of training data points to collect. And using those training data points, it's going to launch some training jobs on a cluster to run. Uh, the other key point here is that we actually run only a few iterations of the job in order to collect some training data, and using that, we can also extrapolate how the future iterations will look. And once we have collected this training data, we then fit it into a linear model, uh, uh, and uh, the output of this linear model uh, it gives us this relation between how uh, the running time varies uh, as we change the number of machines or the input size uh, for our job. So this gives you an end-to-end -end view of how Earnest works. Uh, with that, I'm going to go and talk about some of the evaluation that we did uh, and some of the use case scenarios and also how uh, accurate our, our model is and how long it takes to build our model. Uh, we ran this on a number of different workloads, uh, including Spark MLlib and some of the Keystone pipeline that I showed you before. Uh, and those are the two I'm going to have time to talk about in the talk today, uh, but you can look at the rest of them uh, in our paper and in our GitHub page uh, that I'll talk about a little bit later. So let's start with the same like uh, timid pipeline that I used as a motivating example before. Uh, and uh, this graph here shows the scaling curve for that particular workload on R3 dot extra large instances when running 100 iterations. So one of the big uh, advantages of having this model is that, let's say if we had a two hour deadline, then we could actually pick around 18 machines to run this on EC2, uh, instead of picking let's say 100 machines or so, and thus we could get up to like 5x lower cost just by knowing that around 18 machines is good enough for me to hit my two hour deadline uh, for this particular job that we are running. In terms of accuracy, uh, the way we measure this is that we uh, collect, the, the black line here shows what our model predicts, while the orange dots here show the actual running time that we collected at a number of different configurations. So we find that our prediction error is between like 10 to 15% uh, for a number of different workloads. And mostly we think this is good enough for such a scale uh, because we're only making coarse grain decisions on how many machines to launch or what kind of instance to choose. And thus, uh, predicting the exact running time down to a second is actually not that important for this particular use case. We see similar patterns on a number of different like uh, MLLib algorithms as well, including k-means, regression, naive base, and so on. Um, and uh, these are the actual versus like predicted values where 1.0, meaning that we are exactly accurate, 
uh, 0.8 means that the prediction was uh, lower by 20%, and 1.1 means it was higher by like 10%. So in terms of training time, uh, or how much time did it take to train this model, uh, this is for the same timid pipeline as before. We used seven data points uh, from experiment design to train the model, uh, and then we ran the whole algorithm as well on like 100 iterations. And what we see here is that the overall training time is less than like 5% of the overall running time. And hence, it's effective to use such an approach to build a model for machine learning algorithms. Uh, a similar property can also be seen in like the GLM regression uh, algorithm from MLLib, where we spend less than like 4% of the time in training a model, uh, and we get a pretty good uh, error prediction uh, even with that much, even with just spending that much time. The last thing uh, that I'm going to present in terms of experiments is how useful is this experiment design approach that I presented, especially when you compare to the greedy approach, which is a lot more simpler. Uh, and uh, across a number of different algorithms, what we found was that experiment design gave us a lot lower prediction error compared to the greedy approach. Uh, and that for some uh, workloads like PCA, uh, the greedy, the cost-based approach was like missing the entire uh, uh, performance model, and we were getting really high errors, while experiment design was able to keep us within a small error bracket uh, for a fixed budget, for when both of them were using a fixed budget. So uh, there's a lot more details uh, that we addressed as a part of this research project. Uh, including trying to figure out what, uh, can we figure out when the model is wrong? Like let's say you, your workload doesn't follow the model that I described. Uh, can we detect when the model is wrong automatically? And also can we extend the model for it to cover some other types of workloads uh, that might have like some different computational communication properties? Uh, and finally, we also uh, discussed some like strategies uh, in order to mitigate stragglers or to deal with like sparse data sets. Uh, and there are a lot of details uh, in the paper uh, link that I've put up out there. Now, you might want to try this out as well. Uh, so uh, there's a small Python-based implementation uh, that's open source uh, on the GitHub uh, page in AmpLab. Um, and it just uh, provides uh, Python implementations for the experiment design and the linear regression-based predictor modules. Uh, and there's also an example of like uh, how you would use it when you're using, let's say, Spark uh, ML, uh, MLlib, uh, along with like an RCV1 data set. Uh, so there's a small tutorial out there as well uh, on the GitHub page of Ernest. So in conclusion, uh, there's a, the, the, looking at the workload trends today uh, points to the fact that a large number of users are using what I like to think of as advanced analytics in the cloud. Uh, these advanced analytics have like uh, different communication and computation patterns that severely affect scalability. And especially for more high-level users trying to understand what resource bottlenecks their workload and how to uh, deploy their cluster in a cost-effective way is like really challenging. Uh, to address this problem, uh, we took this approach based on building a performance model uh, with low overhead. Uh, and to do that, we, we, we looked at some of the regular structure that's present in these workloads, and we captured them in this linear model. And uh, in order to reduce the amount of time spent in collecting data, we used techniques from optimal experiment design. Um, I'd be more than happy to talk, uh, talk to you after the talk if you have some workloads or traces that you think would fit well with a framework like this, uh, or if there are some similar problems that you're facing uh, in, 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 your, in, in your scenario as well. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Hi. So, um I saw you when you do the optimal uh, the experiment design, you had three points. Is that the number of uh, uh, data points that is the fix? Or? Uh, it's, it's not fixed. So, uh, the, the, so the, the output of ox, uh, the optimal experiment design, let me just go back to that slide actually one sec. Um, so uh, we do this relaxation that I didn't quite get a chance to talk about. So if you notice, there's this lambda uh, variable here, which is the fraction of times the experiment is run. It's a value between zero and one. Um, and uh, what the result of the experiment design procedure is, is a assignment of lambda for each of these variables, uh, each of these options. So uh, there are some uh, experiment values that it's very confident about. So let's say it's like 1.0 or like 0.9. And some of the things are not that useful at all. So the lambda will be like 0 0.001 or something like that. So we just use a threshold. So we have a threshold of 0.8 or something like that. And everything above that, we just use that as the experiment design training points. Um, but you can also do this in an online fashion, where you sort it by these lambda values, and you pick the most important one first. You run it, and, and then you look at how, uh, how your model is doing, and then you keep on improving it. Um, 
So, uh, so that's the approach we use right now, but we are seeing if there's some ways to improve it in the future. Yeah. Excellent. We got another question back here. So I'm curious, would you would you apply this um, if you were like in elastic environments where mm -hmm. you can add or remove machines mm -hmm. at, at will? Mm -hmm. um, apply this in like an online fashion where mm -hmm. you say you're you're running a stream processing, you get mm -hmm. a large large mm -hmm. group of of events or something that come in that you need to scale your clusters. Like, is this a good solution for mm -hmm. sizing? Yeah, that's a good question. Like uh, whether this is a good approach to do sizing. So uh, if if you looking at it at a slightly higher level, so what we're doing here is more like a static modeling where we're running some iterations of the job for training, um, and then we're using that to build this like uh, model uh, offline. And uh, the 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 elastic sizing thing is a more dynamic operation where you want to let's say like uh, reevaluate your choices every now and then. Um, so, so we, since we were motivated by these machine learning jobs, we did the static approach because they are these long training jobs and you can use a few iterations to see how well they're doing. I think for the dynamic ones, this, this would be a reasonable approach if you're periodically running it. So let's say you rerun this procedure like every hour or every two hours or so on. Uh, but I think there are slightly better techniques like, for example, uh, uh, in, uh, re, uh, in active learning. Like, for example, uh, I think in, in statistics it's called like multi-armed bandits or something like that, where uh, you are doing this exploration versus exploitation of seeing if I increase elasticity, how well does it behave? And then you get back some feedback, and based on that you adjust it again. So I think we might be able to do something better for the online case than just repeatedly training like static models. Uh, but uh, it's still uh, uh, an area of research, so I don't have a very good answer for that. That's, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. We'll come back over here. Hi, uh, Dave Pilatus from Two Sigma. I've noticed that in practice we see varying performance across instance types based on either time of day or even availability zone, and so it becomes a multi-dimensional problem uh, very quickly. So. Have you thought about capturing the other dimensions of the problem? And then the follow-up is, how about crowdsourcing this data so I could run experiments on my cluster and, and give that data to you to inform the model? So two parts. Yeah, so uh, the second part, that would be great, actually. I mean, so uh, this, we don't have a very good way of, like, I think this, I mean, maybe this is a, a Spark module that we can build out, which is uh, to collect some anonymous data, which just gets you the resource usage and like the running times and so on and just exports that. Like maybe if there's a button that we put on the UI that says export logs and like ship it, you know, that would be really useful. Especially for like people doing research, it's very hard to get these realistic uh, traces. Um, to answer the first part of your question about the instance type, uh, so that is one of the problems uh, in, in a sense that, so right now in this particular paper, in this particular project, uh, the way we handle different instance types is we used to model every instance type separately. So in some sense, we are building a model for this job, for this particular instance type, right? Um, and uh, you're right that if you're across instance types, we would actually build separate models for them, you know? Uh, and this quickly becomes a little bit of a pain if you have like 50 different instance types that you're like considering. Uh, so there's some follow-up work that we've been working on which tries to take a more abstract view of the problem, which tries to handle this curse of like dimensionality where you have like five or six dimensions to explore. Uh, the trade of that is that the model becomes more complex and less interpretable. So in, in some sense here, we have a very good interpretation of like communication, computation, and so on. Um, so uh, we can throw more machinery at it. So this particular approach, it's, it's, a, it's a paper in NSTI 2017, which is this year. Uh, it uses Bayesian optimization in order to handle these like five different dimensions. Um, but uh, so there's some trade-offs between the two approaches. The simple approach actually is more understandable and we can run it a little bit more efficiently. Uh, but it, it suffers when you have too many dimensions, uh, while the more complex ones works for better dimen more dimensions, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So we are out of time here. We're going to start a 10-minute break. But first, I just want to thank, thank you very much for coming and presenting here. Uh, give a yeah. round of applause Thanks, here to Shivram.